Good afternoon. On the London match today, a cracking London derby. Crystal Palace against Chelsea. And once again, we're at the heart of the action. Palace on a charge again with only one defeat in their last eight games. And Chelsea know they'll need to be at their very best for this one. It should be a sparky, skillful afternoon of football. And outside, an atmosphere that really matches the occasion. So what else have we got? Well, of course, as usual, the ever-popular feature, all the goals from the First Division programme. And that includes another derby in London, West Ham against Tottenham. Well, we've also got cameras following your favourite London side from the second, third and fourth divisions. And a special report on Charlton Athletic, the team without a home, but not without hope of getting the top bracket this season. Well, the noise has been turned up. We are here at Selhurst Park, the home of the Eagles, Crystal Palace against Chelsea. Our commentator's Alan Parry, and he looks first at two strikers who are beginning to hit it off for the Palace. Well, Mark Bright is clearly enjoying the extra responsibility he's been given since his old partner, Ian Wright, moved to Arsenal. Bright has scored in each of his last eight games. Wright's replacement, Marco Gabbiadini, today plays his sixth game since his move from Sunderland, and he so far has scored two goals. Well, those two have helped Palace to their unique record. They're the only First Division team who've scored in every game so far, and Palace, who are seventh, two places above Chelsea, have lost only once in their last eight games. Their other new signing, Paul Mortimer from Aston Villa, will play on the left of midfield in an unchanged Palace lineup which uh, recently saw Eric Young restored to the centre of defence after five months out through injury. Well, Chelsea relieved that Andy Townsend can play today despite a groin injury, which might eventually require an operation to give him long-term playing prospects. Kerry Dixon also back in the Chelsea side, having missed last week's game against Liverpool, and certainly a welcome return for him. Chelsea make a couple of other changes. Jason Cundy comes in as central defender because Kenny Moncow is suffering from a heavy cold. And in midfield, Graham Stewart returns after a serious shin injury. He replaces 17 years old Andy Myers. Chelsea have lost their last two away games and they're currently two places and two points behind Palace, but must have been encouraged by their display against Liverpool a week ago. The referee today is Mr. David Axel from Southend. So it's Crystal Palace in their familiar red and blue strip who get the game underway, attacking from right to left. Remarkable to think that the bookies actually tipped them as relegation favourites last season. They, in fact, finished third, the highest position in the club's history, and they were never out of the top four from the end of September. And third, in fact, from Christmas right through to the end of the season. Steve Clark, the Chelsea Scottish international fullback with the throw. Cleared by Thorne. Clark in there again for Chelsea. Jeff Thomas, the captain, will leave the throw to Andy Gray, who can get uh, quite a bit of distance. Thomas will go forward as one of his potential targets. It goes in quite short to Gabbiadini this time. Then Sinnott turning it in towards Bright. Goal kick. Young fullback Southgate climbed well then and found Gabbiadini, who couldn't control it first time. Vinnie Jones turning it dangerously back. Thomas almost got in then. And it was good goalkeeping by Kevin Hitchcock to deny the Palace captain. It was a mistake by Vinnie Jones that created the danger. And he could well have been made to pay dearly for that early error. Cleared by Sinnott and then by Thomas, but Boyd turns it back in. Difficult bouncing ball here for Southgate, especially with Lasso right on his toes. But the Chelsea man couldn't keep it in play. Throw into Crystal Palace. Gareth Southgate, the 21-year-old, who had only one league game last season, but is keeping John Humphrey out of the side at the moment. 
through that one straight at Elliott. And Wilson couldn't reach it. Goal kick. Elliott climbing high again and Townsend flicking it on. Young's clearance. And then Southgate completed the job. Gabbiadini saw three defenders converging upon him. He did well to get a foot in the way, really. And Gabbiadini's persistence then. And Palace a throw in. Elliott, one of those forced to uh, cut down the options quickly. And Gray can experiment with the long throw again. Takes it short this time, gets it back from McGoldrick. Boyd and Lasso combining to deny him the cross. Lasso knocked it behind for a throw. Right with the flick header on, and then Eric Young. That was a really difficult one for Hitchcock. Big Eric Young, who hasn't scored this season, with a deft little header, and Hitchcock was backpedalling all the time. And it was a good fingertip save by the Chelsea goalkeeper. Good clearance by Jones this time. It was knocked back in again, but Hitchcock was first to it. Dixon won that header. Turned on by Lasso, and then away by Young. Gray beaten to it, or was he? No. Well, Vinny Jones went in high, he couldn't reach it, and McGoldrick breaks clear for Palace. And indeed wins the corner. Off Boyd's tackle. Mortimer's corner. Hitchcock got there decisively, but the ball only half cleared. Thomas. And in the end, it's Boyd who clears his lines, but good pressure this. And Sinnott strong enough to go through the tackle, and an excellent cross. Oh, that was unlucky. Both the central defenders had stayed forward on the earlier corner, and in the end it was Thorne who got the header in just ahead of Young after that excellent run down the left by Lee Sinnott. He really did well. It was a superb cross at the end of a strong and determined run. The header over the top. Thorne's header turned straight back in by Clark dangerously. Young gets it clear. Stewart for Chelsea. Good skill by Stewart. Wilson in support. He's got Dixon on the far post, but he hit it in a little bit too deep and behind for the goal kick. The Northern Ireland international enjoying a long run again in the team this season. He's been in and out in his Chelsea career, but at the moment, first choice alongside. Kerry Dixon in the Chelsea attack. Gray. Sinnott. Not long for Gabbiadini to chase. Elliott is the defender. Whoops. That was a bit of an embarrassment. Greatly enjoyed by the crowd, not by Paul Elliott, although I think he can see the amusing side of it. He made time for himself for the clearance and then sliced it for a corner. Here's Gray. This could be dangerous. And Gray forces Lasso to tackle him. The tackle was enough. Goal kick. Now Elliot can definitely see the funny side of it. I don't think he's going to enjoy this replay somehow, do you? Look, time. I'll do a bit of a Beckenbauer here. Whoops. Keep your eye on the ball at all times. Gabby Adini, good back healer. Thomas onto it. Great play by the captain. And then, when he needed just a little bit of composure and a little bit of luck with the ball sitting down for him, 
he didn't get it. A typical Thomas surge from midfield. Took it well on the head here. That's where he needed it, just to sit nicely for him. But he scooped it over. Southgate winning the header. A gold rick following it closely. And a good ball by him to Bright, who plays the return instantly. Good challenge, though. Boyd winning it back. That's a useful ball as well. Wilson has gone into intelligent space down the left. Hands end arriving in the middle, but he couldn't get the cross in early enough. And Eric Young defends well for Crystal Palace. McGoldrick. Thomas beats Vinnie Jones to it. Mortimer turning it on. Gabbiadini. Ray showing him where he wants the ball, but he couldn't quite find him. And they have to settle for a throw. Gray leaves it to Southgate and that's a good looking cross Mortimer well, it's not really his strength for Mortimer headers I'm afraid he proved it then the end of a first half that certainly didn't lack incident Thomas coming the closest to a goal the Palace captain but there were so many free kicks and throw-ins that the game was never really able to set into any kind of pattern or give us very much entertainment let's hope it gets better in the second half the half-time score at Selhurst Park is Crystal Palace nil Chelsea nil rejoin us for more action after the break Chelsea are currently giving a trial to the man on the left. It's Peter Chachowski, the Polish international, and he's come over to this country with his agent, a very famous Polish player of years gone by, the great Lubowski. Chelsea get the second half underway. Their midweek ZDS win over Swindon it was only Chelsea's second victory in their last 10 games, rather like Crystal Palace. They've been inconsistent this season, still searching for a settled team formation and a settled spell of form. Certainly one wouldn't expect nil-nil, the current scoreline, to be the final scoreline between these two because they both have a reputation for scoring and conceding goals. Right, trying to keep the ball in play, but it's gone behind for a Chelsea goal kick. Dixon's back header. The ball breaks to Jones. This is Wilson. Three players in the penalty area and finds Clark on the edge of the box, turned in towards Dixon. The ball breaks loose to Lasso. Disappointing shot by young Graham Lasso. No real sting behind it. But still, Chelsea continue to dominate the early stages of the second half here. It's still nil-nil. Townsend finding Lasso. Good looking ball, and Young again forced ahead behind for the corner. He couldn't take a risk. Kerry Dixon was right behind him. Good cross by Lasso. Wilson with the kick. They've got Cundy on the near post. And Dixon, it was Cundy who headed it on. Good football by Gray. And he comes through a twin tackle and still has the ball. Excellent stuff by Andy Gray. And a great ball too. Onside, Mark Bright, Mortimer to his left. Gabbiadini furthers forward. Mortimer's shot deflects off Elliott to relative safety. 
as Sinnott drives it back in. And Gabbiadini felt he was pushed in the back then by Boyd. The referee doesn't agree. 55 minutes completed in this game, still nil-nil. At the moment, Chelsea looking the most likely side to score. The referee having a word with uh, Alan Smith, the assistant manager of Crystal Palace. Wally Downs, the great character on the right, saw something amusing, <laughs> even if the referee didn't. come on and with 17 minutes of the second half gone Chelsea looking dangerous once again as Dixon flicks it on There's no doubt that uh, Chelsea have started this second half in very positive fashion Mortimer finding bright Gabbiadini takes over a good return ball Thomas with the cross and it had to be headed behind pat on the back for Jason Cundy from Paul Elliott but a corner for Crystal Palace Goldrick has gone over to take it. Eric Young has come forward. So have Bourne, the other centre-half. Oh, it was almost an own goal and fumbled away. That was lucky. Chelsea relieved then. But they got away with this. The ball flicking off Kerry Dixon's head. Well saved by Hitchcock. Jones got it clear this time. And then Lasso to Wilson. Just run out of room there, Wilson, but he has won the throw off Southgate. Boyd. Cundy turning it much too deep. A tremendous kick which Elliot did well to reach Nigel Martin has really launched some very deep kicks in this game which has given Elliot and his defenders a few problems so after Chelsea's promising start of the second half it's Palace who are coming back Andy Gray finding Gabbiadini with the throw turned on again by Sinnott offside the linesman has flagged. It's a free kick to Chelsea. Foul then by Stewart backing into Sinnott. free kick Mark Bright comes to meet it so too did Jason Cundy and it's Stewart who gets it clear Young heading it back in sit it straight to Clark and at the other end it's offside and that little spell summed up the frustrations of this game the ball spending a lot of time in the air and then finally when it was played along the ground there was an offside goes another high free kick to Bright who heads it down for Gabbiadini took too much time Jones took it off him comes back to Gray though too deep for Bright challenge by Gray the referee saw nothing wrong with it 
McGoldrick, Gabbiadini, back to McGoldrick, this looks promising, Gabbiadini, somehow or other Hitchcock kept it out with his feet, well no wonder Gabbiadini's frustrated, and no wonder that Chelsea think that for the moment at least they don't really need to be looking around for another goalkeeper because Kevin Hitchcock is playing exceptionally well and that proved it it's his fifth game in a row and his 11th this season he's keeping Dave Besant out and he deserves to on his performances in the last seven days against Liverpool and here today two years out of the first team Kevin Hitchcock and Gabbiadini then must have felt he scored his third goal for Palace only to see the goalkeeper intervene with his legs Thomas turning it on Gabbiadini chasing again but Elliot's quick he's got to have pace to control Gabbiadini and he's had it Chelsea have the throw. Clark deep for Wilson, and it was well spotted by uh, Sinnott, who headed it behind for another Chelsea throw, which doubtless will be hurled in by Vinny. It's a useful one. Wilson almost got there. Thomas with the clearance. Billy will be happy for, to uh, see that one go for another throw. And another good throw as well. And turn back for Wilson to shoot. Well, it was blocked in the nick of time by Thorne. Although the danger hasn't gone yet, it has now. Just as well for Crystal Palace that they had plenty of bodies in the way then. Because... Vinnie Jones' throw caused a good deal of havoc as it was flicked on there by Dixon. Wilson shot, charged away. And the so climbing high. And got there the second time. Wilson with a through ball for Dixon. Good first time effort by Kerry Dixon. The sharpest he's looked today. But couldn't keep the ball down low enough to trouble Martin in the Palace goal but have to hit that one first time just the three goals this season Kerry Dixon but that uh, groin problem has been constant trouble to him Townsend looking for Dixon again it's Thorne who clears and onside it hit Gabbiadini on the back Poor clearance by Boyd, gives Palace possession again, but Boyd can make up for the error and does so very stylishly. Hit long for Dixon to chase, Gray anticipated the danger and got out of a tricky little situation very cleverly. And then hits a splendid ball for Mortimer. Excellent play by Gray. And Mortimer looking dangerous too. Well, it was well wide of target in the end, but... Uh, Good to see Mortimer with the confidence to try that one. The former England under-21 international getting his place here because of the injury to John Solarco. Andy Gray, my man of the match, setting up the opening. Wilson. Great shout of handball, not given, as Townsend turns it on. Sinnott clear, Jones playing it back in, and Young did well. Bright. Gabbiadini. Gabbiadini was floored by Kundi as he played the ball forward. He's won the free kick. There's been a bit of... Uh, Activity on the Palace bench. I think they're about to make a substitution. It could even be Gabbiadini who's coming off. Chris Coleman about to make his first appearance since 
latest signing from Swansea in the summer. And it could be Gabbiadini he replaces. But Gabbiadini, having won this free kick, steps back to see Andy Gray take a long run at it. And a good effort. Well, well struck, but also well wide of target. Bill kick. And that'll be the moment for Coleman to come on. And as I suspected, it is Gabbiadini who's coming off. Not really had the most effective game. And the 21-year-old who can play either at centre-half or up front, which is presumably where he'll go to replace Gabbiadini, comes on for his Crystal Palace debut. Steve Coppel hoping he might break the deadlock. Elliott's clearance. Southgate in there again. As both sides go for the winner here, we could be in for an exciting final ten minutes at Selhurst Park. Here's Mark Bright. Well, it was his only real opportunity of the game to extend that run of having scored in each of his last eight games. Only Gary Lineker has scored more goals amongst first division players this season than Mark Bright's 13. Not to be that time. Chelsea about to make a substitution. Damian Matthew coming on. And it looks like Graham Lasso, the player he'll replace. Chelsea supporters don't appear to be too happy with that decision. Damian Matthew, the man they call a Wheater because he bears a physical resemblance. And he's not a bad runner either. The 20 year old takes Lasso's place. Young fouling Dixon. And Dixon carries on for the free kick. Townsend. Matthew straight into the action. And a useful looking cross as well towards Dixon. The linesman was flagging as Dixon went up then. And I believe the decision is a free kick against the Chelsea man for a foul as the cross came in. We're into the final minute here in this London derby, which is as yet goalless. Gray. Well, he hit the cross altogether too high. Young's header, and that's the final action of a frankly disappointing game. A hard-fought, goalless draw here at Selhurst Park. Kevin Hitchcock's good goalkeeping for Chelsea, one of the reasons that we didn't see the deadlock broken. Plenty of effort, plenty of endeavour, plenty of crisp tackling and good defending by both sides. But in all honesty, with Jeff Thomas's lone opportunity in the first half of Park, not a lot of goal-mouth incident, not a lot of quality football. It ends then, all square at Selhurst Park. Crystal Palace nil, Chelsea nil. Well, I think I may have misled you a little bit there. It wasn't uh, anything like the game we thought it was going to be. It certainly, Mark Bright, wasn't a forwards game, was it? No, not today. Um, chances were at a premium. And when they did drop, I think the goalkeeper made a good save. Very hard going indeed. Yeah. Um, Chelsea came in, I think, uh, to be fair to them, they did well. Um, we got a good home reputation. We scored a lot of goals and they defended really well. Your form's been so good lately, nine goals in the last eight games. I mean, there is life after Ian Wright, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's been some of the best run, actually, for the club. And um, just coincided with Ian, Ian leaving. But um, chances have been falling to me, maybe won a game sometimes and have scored. So, you know, maybe today um, wasn't my day. We've been struggling to score goals. Um, but equally in the same context, we've had in injuries to key players and suspensions as well. Um, we've got some promising youngsters coming through, but they, take, they can't take all the responsibility. I think it's up to the more senior players uh, to work hard, um, give them a bit of assistance, and I'm sure over the medium to long term, things will get good. Now, there has been talk about you leaving Crystal Palace. What's mm -hmm. the very latest on that? Um, it, I think a lot of it's been speculation. Um, one club, Chris, uh, QPR, they did make a bid, and that's the only club who's made a bid, and the boss put that to me and I didn't think it, that was the right move for me. Um, 
apart from that, I've just got on with the job. He's quite pleased with my attitude and um, it's been the best way at Crystal Palace. Do you feel your own game has improved by the, the experiences in Pisa with the, the Italian First Division and in Celtic as well? As far as I'm concerned, when I went to Italy, um, I was a boy before I went and I was a man when I came back. I think it was um, the turning point of my whole uh, professional career. It was a marvellous experience, an experience that, as far as I'm concerned, educates you for life. And after that, going to Celtic in Scotland, naturally there was a, an environmental and cultural shock initially, but after I settled down, I was very happy uh, with my performances there. Paul, congratulations on your performance today. Well, still to come on the London match today, we've got uh, all the goals from the London matches played in the second, third and fourth division, and of course, all the goals from the first division, 26 of them, including victories for Arsenal, for Queen's Park Rangers, and for West Ham in that London derby, and new leaders of the first division, Leeds United. That's all after the break. This net didn't exactly bulge today, the only goal is draw in the first division here at Sellers Park. But there were 26 goals elsewhere in the first division, and that's what comes next, in the company of Alan Parry and Gabriel Clark. And we begin at Upton Park with West Ham against Spurs. Just five minutes gone in East London when Spurs and Gary Lineker carry on where they left off in midweek. Lineker springs the offside trap, but his 16th of the season was the high point of Tottenham's afternoon. West Ham have got an informed striker of their own in Mike Small and when Mitchell Thomas's shot falls right to his feet Small takes his tally for the season to 11. And the day belonged to Thomas signed from Spurs last season. Kevin Keane's cross is only half knocked out and Thomas is on hands to put the Hammers 2-1 up. Spurs third league defeat in a row rounded off by Gordon Jury sending off in the last minute. He'd already been booked. He might have gone anyway for that challenge on Stuart Slater. Despite their difficult midweek game in Portugal, Arsenal showed their resilience against Notts County, whose goalkeeper Steve Cherry had kept the champions at bay for an hour before Anders Limpar crossed for Alan Smith to score his 12th goal of the season. With a quarter of an hour to go, Paul Merson's accurate through ball gave Ian Wright the chance to display the cool finishing which has already brought him seven goals in six games. An afternoon to savour for Leeds United, one for Oldham's Brian Kilkline to forget because he scored the only goal. Gary McAllister's cross and Kilkline gives keeper John Hallworth no chance. Leeds top for the first time in 17 years. Liverpool had Glenn Hussein and Jan Mulby playing for the first time this season. And both were involved in the move for the winning goal against Coventry at Anfield. Ian Rush also played a part. And then Mark Walters' cross finally poked in by Ray Houghton. Liverpool winning for the first time in six league games. A lot's been said about Manchester United's young stars, but Manchester City have a couple of their own. Mike Sharon. Fresh to the first team this season, puts them one up against Sheffield United. But it was many happy returns to Main Road for central defender Brian Gale. He had it United level. Three minutes later, the goal of the game, Sharon puts Adrian Heath away on the right. And when Heath's cross comes in, it's rounded off with a flourish by Niall Quinn. But again, City let the lead slip, again from a corner, and again, it's Brian Gale. Four goals in the first half, but stalemate in the second until 16 minutes from time. Quinn's turn, his shot hits the post, but following up, 20-year-old Michael Hughes makes no mistake. City's third win in a row, United stay bottom. Luton's fragile hold on their first division life was further threatened by their seventh away defeat. 1-0 at Norwich, the goal scored by Rob Newman, Norwich's first league win for five matches. At the city ground, one of the surprises of the day, inspired by one of the goals of the day. A stunning strike from Matthew Letizia, and that was a taste of things to come. Forrest had central defender Carl Tyler sent off for a foul on Alan Shearer in the first half. After a lovely back heel from Letizia, it was Shearer brought down again, this time by Darren Wassell. 
for the penalty. And Letizia's spot kick all but wrapped things up, although the Saints and the man from the Channel Islands went marching on. A minute later, his cross evades Des Walker, but not Shearer, who gets number three. Forrest did get one back, a good strike in its own right from Kingsley Black, but afterwards Brian Clough was the first to admit his side had been outplayed. Queen's Park Rangers had failed to win in their previous six league games at Loftus Road, but they took an early lead against Everton. Dennis Bailey scoring for the fourth time in four games. Just after half-time, Everton fell for the old one-two, when Simon Barker exchanged passes with Ian Holloway before Barker went on to score his sixth goal of the season and Rangers at last looked set for a home win. Everton, who'd won six of their previous eight games, pulled a goal back. A rather scrambled effort, Kevin Sheedy's toe poke finally being turned in by Tony Cotty. That's six this season for the former West Ham striker. In the final minute of the game, Rangers made sure of their fourth win in a row with a quite superb goal by Barker. 3-1 then, and Jerry Francis' team certainly playing some good football. Wimbledon had won at Villa Park on their last three league trips. The chances of making it four evaporated in half an hour. Ian Olney in for the injured Dalian Atkinson put Villa one up on nine minutes. And Olney had a big hand in the second on the half hour. An inch perfect pass and an inch perfect finish from Dwight York. Wimbledon manager Peter Wythe back at his old club did see his players battle hard in the second half. And later on, John Fashionu added a few more pounds to his ever-increasing price tag. The biggest crowd of the day, though, at Hillsborough, the commentator, John Hill. The ball into the middle lane for Hurst, head! Absolutely brilliant. Oh, no, that's a dreadful mistake, and it's given an equaliser to Brian McClare. Hurst losing out to Parker, and it was a fair challenge. Oh, and here's McClare inside the area. Giggs teeing up Robson. Brian Robson can make it 2-1. He's still got a chance. Oh, and it's going into the net. Isn't it? What an extraordinary mess. It's 2-1 to Manchester United. And have you ever seen a sloppier goal than that? Wednesday of three outfield players outside the penalty area. Here is one of them, Roland Nielsen, who whacks it back in. Must be a chance here. Jensen, 2-2. Now it's a corner. Can Wednesday get anything from this? Yes, they can. It's 3-2. So, new leaders of Division 1. Leeds United with their win over Oldham Athletic. They are pipping Manchester United, who were beaten at Sheffield Wednesday. It really has been a bad week for United. Manchester City are third, Arsenal fourth, Sheffield Wednesday are fifth, and Aston Villa for the first time moving into the top six. And at the bottom, Queen's Park Rangers and West Ham have moved above Notts County, Luton and Sheffield United at the bottom. Now let's catch up with the London action outside the first division. And I alerted you last week to the excellent football being played these days by Charlton Athletic. True enough, they beat Brighton last weekend, and then when they beat Oxford in midweek, they went to second place in the second division on goal difference behind the leaders Middlesbrough. Let's join Gabriel Clark. And he's got a good cross in. Oh, what a goal! It's almost 15 years to the day since Derek Hales scored the goal of the season. Nine years since Alan Simonson, European Footballer of the Year, wore the Charlton number no. 7 shirt. And six years since they locked up the valley and all but threw away the key. That Charlton are going back to a new revamped stadium is a major triumph for the supporters. It's also turned into a major test of patience. The homecoming at the start of the season never materialised and two months later the Valley still awaits the safety alterations that will bring the grounds up to Premier League status. That should be by next March, providing the chairman comes up with the money. It's doubly important to get back there. 
and I feel for the fans. I mean, I'm as frustrated as anybody uh, as a fan, and, I, and I, I can certainly understand why you know, they say to me, you know, why aren't we there? But uh, all I can say is just, you, you've just got to hang on in. We'll be there. What's made the waiting game much easier has been Charlton's form at Upton Park, especially after the departure of Lenny Lawrence, which was almost like a death in the family. His replacements are rapidly proving two heads are better than one. Keep going now! Take your time, take your time, shut it up! Alan Kerbishley and Steve Gritz had no hesitation in teaming up as joint managers and they've got Charlton off to a flying start. The 2-1 win at Oxford on Wednesday night was their fifth league victory in a row. It put Charlton joint top of Division 2. We've put everything into it really, the job. I mean, we've, we have, we've gone a lot. Lot, uh, watched a lot of teams and we've done our own work on a lot of teams. We have worked hard for the success and so have the players. We I mean, they've responded really. We actually said at the start of the season we could surprise one or two people. Um, and I think we have done that. Um, so we had, a, we had a lot of confidence in what the lads could do. Um, it, apart from two or three players, it's basically the same players that, that were here last season. So we knew what they were capable of. Um, and as I said, we, we did say we could surprise some people. And I think that's happening now. And the possibility of going joint top of Division 2 tempted more than 2,000 Charlton fans down the A13 to South End. They didn't know it, but they were in for quite an afternoon. And quite a display from referee Kelvin Morton. It all burst into life on the half hour. Steve Gatting got himself in a tangle with Andy Ansar. Penalty, according to Mr Morton, who thought long and hard about a professional foul before showing Gatting the yellow card. South End had missed seven penalties in a row since February. Dean Austin made it unlucky number eight for Charlton. It got worse. Two minutes later, referee Morton took exception to comments from the Charlton dugout, and one half of the managerial duo got his marching orders. But Alan Kerbishley's view from the back of the stands was just as uncomfortable. Right on half time, Gatting connected late with Ian Benjamin and didn't leave Mr Morton, to be fair, too much alternative. Gatting won't agree, but it was almost the best thing that could have happened. Ten men Charlton took control in the second half. Colin Walsh inches away from a spectacular equaliser. On 54 minutes, though, Carl Lieburn levelled things up. And the game looked there for the taking when Spencer Pryor bundled over Gary Nelson. Gatting's first offence got him a yellow card. Pryor wasn't quite as lucky. But then neither was Darren Pitcher with the penalty. Paul Sanson with the save. Charlton had missed one guilt edge chance, but Robert Lee got them another. No doubt about the penalty. This time, no card of any sort for the offender, but no luck either for Colin Walsh. All the same, a point that pleased the men in charge. They don't know when to give up, basically. Uh, they've only let themselves down once this year at Watford. We think, anyway. Um, and they show today that, on their day, they're, they're as capable of playing as good a football as anyone. As far as the dugout incident is concerned, uh, Alan, uh, any comment at the moment? No, obviously I'm going to make no comment on the incident. Uh, I'm just going to have to wait to see uh, what the referee's report is. I'll get him in my office Monday and have a word with him, I think. Yeah. Charlton's South London neighbours Millwall met a Derby County side which had won four of their previous five games in the league and it was two players on loan to Derby who did the damage. Bobby Davison scoring Derby's first that's his fifth in four games since Leeds loaned him out. Just before half-time, Millwall equalised. Bill Barber's cross set it up. John Colquhoun's layoff. Paul Kerr's fifth of the season, which for a long time looked good enough to rescue a point. But in the 89th minute, a scrambled effort by Ian Ormondroyd, who's on loan from Aston Villa, gave Derby their winner and sent Millwall to their fourth league defeat at the Den. They drop down to 18th place. Derby County stay sixth. Three vital points for Watford at bottom of the table, Plymouth, but they did it the hard way. Things started well enough. Plymouth keeper Reese Wilmot flapping at Jason Drysdale's free kick and Darren Baisley on the line to put Watford one up. 
But five minutes later, Watford were reduced to ten men. Fullback Nigel Gibbs taking exception to Mark Fiore's tackle. And the referee took exception to Gibbs's retaliation. And his teammates had to ride their luck a little after that. Plymouth twice hit the woodwork. But Dwight Marshall's effort was as close as they got to beating David James. In the third division, Brentford are still going strong. Two goals before half-time when they visited Berry. Dean Holdsworth, the man on target, and indeed the man in form. When Berry goalkeeper Gary Kelly went on walkabout, his foul on Gary Blissett led to a Brentford free kick. And from it, it was that man Holdsworth who scored again to bring his tally for the season to 15 goals. That's almost twice as many as he scored in the whole of last season. With almost an hour gone, Brentford made sure of victory and moved up to second place, just a point behind the leaders, Birmingham, when Marcus Gale scored to make it 3-0. At Craven Cottage, three more points for Fulham and one goal enough to decide it. Four minutes before half-time, Simon Morgan with the crucial header from Martin Fikes cross. And Alan Dix's side were unlucky not to double that lead after Gary Brazil's hard running. Kelly Hargett is with the shot, but watch out for a stunning goal line clearance from Steve Senior. A win all the same for Fulham, and they go seventh. Lake Norian's away form is letting them down. At Stoke City, good work by Tony Ellis. Laid on the 14th goal of the season for Wayne Biggins to give the home team the lead. Orient, unbeaten at Brisbane Road, slipped to their fifth away defeat when Ian Cranston headed Stoke second. They move up to sixth place now. Orient slipped down to tenth. In Division 4, the Barnet bandwagon rolls on, although the Scarborough defence did play a major part in both their first half goals. Some desperate defending still can't stop Paul Schowler heading in number one. And the second from Roger Willis really did owe a big helping hand to the Scarborough keeper. It was a stroll for Barry Fry's side after that. Scarborough had no answer to the lightning break that set up Gary Bull for his 14th of the season. And two minutes from time, Barnett broke through again. Willis waltzing through for his second and Barnett's fourth. What an amazing season Barnett are having. Do you know that's 13 league games they've played in the fourth division and they've scored 33 goals. Lying second in the table now, well done. Well, that's a complete London football roundup for you, which I hope very much you've enjoyed. And there's more football for you, in fact, on ITV on Tuesday night. A full look at the Rumbelows Cup matches that night. Tuesday on ITV. But now, from all of us here at Selhurst Park, good afternoon.